Namaskaramye na tasma shri guru ve nama Shri Chaitanya mano bishtam shtapitam ye na bhutale Swayam rupa kadamayam dadati swapadantikam Nama om Vishnu padaya krishna prashtaya bhutale Srimate bhakti vedanta swamini tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpaturubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhyevacha Patitanam Pavanipyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha So as I was saying, I was in a little bit of some transcendental anxiety. Um, there were almost too many things going on prior to this Ekadashi. You know, what, what do we speak about? We had Sita Navmi, we had the appearance day of Sita Devi, we had Janava Mata's appearance day all on the same day, disappearance day of Marupande. We are in the midst of Chandan Yatra. We have Rukmini Dwadasis coming tomorrow. And then there's Nushringa Chaturdashi coming. So who do we speak about? What happens? <laughs> and so I was really kind of looking, I'm like, there's like six different things that, and topics that you could speak about. How do you decide? Or, or which one do you say, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna leave aside this one, and then we'll talk about this one, or we'll leave aside these two and talk about these four. Like, what, what do we do? And I prayed to Ekadashi Devi, and then I read the glories of this Ekadashi, and then I thought, we're gonna talk about Ekadashi. <laughs> it's not often that we come together and we read the glories of the Ekadashi in these lectures, and so um, I'm gonna do that. And we'll talk about the the treasure of association because I feel like that is such a theme for any and all devotees uh, one of the most important things for all of us is the treasure of association and how it is possible for that association to change our lives and so we will use that as a thread to combine all of these wonderful mystical things that have occurred for us. So we can start with the glories of Mohini Ekadashi. Sri Yudhishthira Maharaj said, O Janardan Krishna, what is the name of the Ekadashi that occurs during the light fortnight, Shukla Paksha, of the month of Vaishak, April, May? What is the process for observing it properly? Kindly narrate all of these details to me. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, replied, O oh, blessed son of Dharma, what Vashishta Muni once told to Lord Ramachandra, I shall now describe to you. Please hear me attentively. So I, I feel as though, how fortunate is Yudhishthir to be able to sit sometimes in a garden, sometimes in an assembly room, sometimes even in his own private chambers and be able to ask Krishna any question you like. And so, so many of these Ekadashis begin with Yudhishthira asking Krishna, can you please tell me what, what's happening? Tell me a way to, to make my life better. Tell me a way where I can soothe my heart and my mind from so many things that are, that are happening in the world, in my own life. Imagine if we had the ability to sit beside Krishna and just ask him any question we like. And Krishna is never exasperated, right? He's never feeling like exhausted from all of these questions. He just patiently, oh, emperor of the world, oh, blessed son of Dharma, who is his own cousin. And speaking of the glory of Yudhishthira, Whenever Krishna would see him, he would offer him obeisances as his elder. How incredible is Yudhishthira? And we kind of all do have this opportunity. Because of the blessings of Srimad Bhagavatam, because of the blessings of Srila Prabhupada, we can sit beside Krishna at any moment and ask him any question 
that's weighing on our minds or our hearts and receive an answer. Sometimes it's not the answer that we want, but we'll receive an answer through the mercy of Shastra, which I was kind of ruminating on for the past few weeks and realizing that whenever I read Shastra, I want to be reminded that Shastra is on my side. Shastra is not there to condemn me, even if I feel called out. Shastra is on my side, actually. Can, can I read this as an ever well-wishing parent that is there to soothe me, that is on my side, eventually, ultimately, working for my greatest good instead of feeling like I've only been chastised or feeling as though I, I you know what, this Shastra is too logical. It's too reasonable. It's telling me all the things that I don't want to hear. Can I look for the ways that it's uplifting me even when I do nothing else but simply read? Can I look for the ways where Shastra is directly from the lips of Krishna? That is nectar. Everybody's looking for that nectar. Krishna plays the flute. Everyone's looking to hear it. Everyone's looking for the same fortune that Krishna comes into Dwarka. He blows his conch shell. And then everyone's thinking that conch shell is so fortunate. Can I remember? This is that same nectar. And it's never working against me. So this is Yudhishthira's fortune. This is our fortune. So Lord Ramachandra asked Vashishta Muni, Oh great sage, I would like to hear about the best of all fasting days, that, dis that day which destroys all kinds of sins and sorrows. Imagine, you know, Lord of the universe is asking for a way to soothe his own suffering. Well, this is, this is clearly a symptom of the material world. God is now looking for a way to alleviate suffering. And isn't that, isn't that all of us? We are looking for a way to alleviate our suffering. And then sometimes we feel really bad about it. Why should I be looking for a way to alleviate my suffering? I should be more humble and I should just endure. But even the Supreme Person, Lord Ramachandra, is looking for a way to, to cope with enduring. This is the material world that doesn't spare anyone. Not even if you are the most spiritual person, not even if you are the supreme personality of Godhead, you are not spared the trials and the tribulations. So now let's see what happens when Lord Ram looks for a way to relieve them. I have suffered long enough in separation from my dear Sita, who happened to be kidnapped at that point. So Lord Ram had lost his wife due to the machinations of a ten-headed demon king named Ravan. And so Ram says, I wish to hear from you about how my suffering can be ended. The sage Vashishtha replied, O oh Lord Ram, O oh you whose intelligence is so keen, simply by remembering your name, one can cross the ocean of the material world. You have questioned me in order to benefit all of humanity and fulfill everyone's desires. I shall now describe that day of fasting which purifies the whole world. Many times I get asked the question, do I really believe this? Uh, many people say, you, you really think that there's just one day you observe some sort of penance or, or tapasya, some sort of willing self-sacrifice, right? You, you take up a fast on that day and you really think that this is supposed to clear all sins, burdens, all kinds of things in the heart. Um, my answer is, these holy, these holy days reciprocate with you in the way that we approach them. So it will work if you think it works. And if you do not think it works, it may not work the same. Like the potency might be a little bit lacking. We, I have heard, from many spiritual teachers that when you go to receive an Ayurvedic treatment, they will give you the treatment, but you also need to be able to ingest it, right? You need a tonic to be able to help you ingest it. Otherwise the potency might not be so strong. 
You can take all the herbs that you want, but if you can't ingest them, it doesn't work. So now we have the, the tonic of our spiritual teachers to help us ingest and obtain the full potency of these fasting days. So the answer is really simple. It depends on us. It works if we have faith that it works. So have faith, have full faith that these days work. Even Ram had faith that they would work. How incredible is this? Lord Ram had so much faith in a Kadashi, in a fasting day, in something that could alleviate his suffering and his sorrow, that he risked so much just to ask. And how incredible it is. Like what, what would be available to us if we had the courage to ask? Sometimes we think, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't trouble these people. I shouldn't ask. Maybe we should. Maybe we should unburden our hearts. Maybe we should say, going through such a sorrowful time, I'm having a rough time. I'm suffering. Can you devotees help me? They say that you're so dear to the Lord. Can you help me? This is what begins Srimad Bhagavatam. Sages all getting together and saying, can you help? Oh, Shonaka, oh, Sutta, can you help? Oh, Shukadev Goswami, can you help us? We are ready to observe a yagya, a spiritual sacrifice. For a thousand years, we are ready. But now we're not sure if that sacrifice is enough. Can you help? We don't know where to turn anymore. And then somehow, the, the solution is simple. All of these great sages and, and spiritual seekers and knowers of divine knowledge come together and they say, the solution is simple. Simply hear about faith. Hear about the ways that God interacts with all of us. This gives us solace. So sometimes we have to have the courage to simply ask, be honest that we are going through a rough time. It doesn't make us strange or off the beaten path. It actually seems as though that's part of the journey. We have to have off days. Otherwise, it, it seems like it's not like legitimate. You know, it's not, you are not a certified spiritual seeker if you've only had good days because Bhagavad Gita came about because Arjuna was having a bad day. Srimad Bhagavatam came about because all of these people were having bad days. Ramayan, Mahabharat, all of the best spiritual texts, epics, poems, histories happened because someone was having a bad day. And they had the courage and the wherewithal to say, it's me, I'm the one having the bad day, can someone help me? So now Lord Ram has taken it upon himself. He's taken up this mantle of being completely honest. He is suffering in the absence of his wife, which, let me just say, for four months of a rainy season, he sat in a cave. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't sleep. He simply chanted her name and he cried. So this is how we get to weave in the birth the birth appearance of Sita Devi in with this Akadashi. Good, we've done that. <laughs> o Ram, that day is known as Vaishak Shukla Ekadashi, which falls on Dwadasi sometimes. It removes all sins and is famous as Mohini Ekadashi. Truly, O oh dear Ram, the merit of this Ekadashi frees the fortunate soul who observes it from the network of illusion. Therefore, if you want to relieve your sufferings, observe this auspicious Ekadashi perfectly, for it removes all obstacles from one's path and relieves the greatest miseries. Kindly listen as I describe its glories, because for one who even just hears about this auspicious Ekadashi, the greatest sins are nullified. And again, our spiritual truths are reciprocal. So as long as we believe it does, it does. So now I encourage us all to, sometimes, you know, we don't think about having to turn on our lungs to make them work or 
having to make sure that like this morning I was having like camera mic issue and to make sure that it was turned on and plugged in correctly but we don't have to do that with our lungs right that 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 work is conspicuous by its absence we don't have to try but with our faith sometimes it's like a muscle we haven't used in a long time so we have to turn it on so I encourage us all let, let's let's turn on that faith muscle let's stretch it out let's make sure that it's working Let's, let's make sure that it's engaged, focusing correctly. Let's just be receptive to the blessings that this Ekadashi has to offer us. Sometimes it is as simple as saying, okay, I, I surrender in that I will now receive all of these blessings that the Lord wants to bestow upon me. I will now, I will, I'm no longer going to tell Krishna, you can't make this happen. I will no longer forcibly reject the, the Akadashi blessings. So for one who simply hears about it, the greatest sins are nullified. On the banks of the Saraswati River, there was once a beautiful city named Badravati, which was ruled by King Dutiman. Oh, Ram, that steadfast, truthful, and highly intelligent king was born in the dynasty of the moon, Chandravanch. In his kingdom was a merchant named Danapala, who possessed a great deal of wealth, of food grains, and money. He was also very pious. Danapala arranged for lakes to be dug, sacrificial arenas to be erected, and beautiful gardens to be cultivated for the benefit of all the citizens of Bhadravati. He was an excellent devotee of Lord Vishnu and had five sons, Suman, Dutiman, Medavi, Sukriti, and Drishta Buddhi. So there was a king named Dutiman, and then this Danpala merchant named one of his sons Dutiman. It's a great name. Unfortunately, his son Drishta Buddhi was always engaged in greatly sinful activities, such as sleeping with prostitutes and associating with similar degraded persons. He enjoyed illicit sex, gambling, and many other varieties of acts aimed at gratifying the senses. He disrespected the demigods, the devas, the brahmins, the sages, the forefathers, and other elders of the community, as well as his family's guests. The evil-hearted Drishtabuddhi spent up his father's wealth indiscriminately, always feasting on untouchable foods and drinking alcohol to excess. This kind of sounds like someone who, if they walked into an ISKCON center, you'd probably try and call your temple commander and make sure that they did not step further foot into said ISKCON center. So, I mean, you know, it, it's always amazing. Sometimes I like to sit back from these spiritual texts and stories and ask, would I see the potential in any of these people to become a devotee? Would I? Would, would I block their path? Would I say, hey, no, no, you're not ready? You know, we, we have the example of Jai and Vijay. They happen to guard the gates of Vaikuntha, the spiritual abode of Lord Vishnu. And once upon a time, as we know, four young boys arrived at the gate and said, we wish to see Lord Vishnu. I said, you boys can't possibly see the Lord. There are yogis and sadhus and saints who have been self-sacrificing and doing penance and tapasya for thousands of years just to gain a glimpse of the effulgence of one toenail. And you, you young boys, you don't look older than five. And what are you, like, you, you can't be older than five. You're small, you're naked. Like what, what makes you think that it's that easy? You can't go see God. Come back later. Go do some penance. Come back when you're older, more mature. This leads to these four young looking boys, because they happen to be thousands of years old. They simply decided to stay looking five because they thought, you know, at five, no one's really concerned with all of the things that the material world has to offer. They're not concerned with home and spouses and wealth and jobs and money and any of those things. Said, so, you know what, let, let, let's remain five. No one's, gonna de no one's gonna demand much of us if we remain five. We can simply remain 
steeped in, in spiritual adventures. And so this leads to these four young looking boys cursing Giant of Ujai. And they say, you know, you're not fit to guard the gates of God. You're only looking at externals. Go, go to some place where only the externals matter. You can go to the material world. Yikes. This is a problem. So now I'm looking at this Drishta Buddhi and I'm thinking, does he have any redeeming qualities? Is there anything redeeming about this man that I would think that he would be the subject of an Ekadashi story for the rest of time? Here's a person who has done pretty much all of the wrong things. You know, you have four regulative principles and he's breaking all of them. Right? Carte blanche. Breaking them all. No problem. Do I think that people like that can be redeemed? And even if I did think, how long would it take? You know, is it, is it one of those things I'm like, you could be redeemed, just not in this lifetime. Good luck. Have I, like, have I like washed my hands of him within the first couple of paragraphs of hearing about him? So let's see what happens with Drishta Buddhi. One day, Don Fala kicked Drishta Buddhi out of the house after he saw him walking along the road arm in arm with a known prostitute. From then on, all Drishtabuddhi's relatives were highly critical of him and distanced themselves from him also. After he had sold all of his inherited ornaments and become destitute, the prostitute also abandoned him and insulted him because of his poverty. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen, there is a, a television show called Intervention, and they go to people who have had really heavy problems and addictions, and the family will often perform an intervention. You know, here is how your actions have negatively impacted me in the following ways. They have a mediator, they have people, and then they have consequences, right? If you don't stop, we're gonna cut you off. The family will no longer speak to you. We'll have to take away your inheritance, the whole deal. So here, even in scripture, right, thousands of years ago, same thing was still happening. So now Don Pala, his father, has had to perform this emergency intervention. And he's thinking, you know, I, I, can't, I can't deal with you like this. And there's nothing that gets you to stop. And so he has to forcibly cut him off, which I can only imagine was very, very painful for the father. No one wants to have to do that to their child. So I'm, I'm imagining the pain of this family they're going through a rough time. You've got the black sheep of the family and now no one wants to talk about them. No one wants to talk about the road that they've taken. And so now Drishtabuddhi has not only been abandoned by his family, but also by the prostitute, who I'm sure he probably thought was there for a reason other than money. But unfortunately, it seems as though as soon as his money was gone, so was the prostitute. So now he's kind of lost almost everything. Drishtabuddhi was full of anxiety now and also hungry. So he thought, what should I do? Where should I go? How can I maintain myself? He then began to steal. The king's constables arrested him. But when they learned who it was and that his father was the famous Danpala, they released him. He was caught and released this way many times. Which is amazing. On the strength of his father's identity, he was somehow spared by the law. This is us. On the strength of the blessings of our spiritual teachers, on the strength of the blessings of Krishna and Srila Prabhupada and all of our gurus, we are being spared the harsh chastisement of the material world. And then we walk around arrogantly thinking, God's never done anything for me. You know, if he really wanted to do something for me, why wouldn't he give me all, the, all of the things that I want when I want them? Meanwhile, we never understand that we are always being sheltered by the Lord's umbrella of mercy. We never know what could have been for us. Srila Prabhupada would often tell many, many disciples, they would ask, you know, why? What's the deal with Maya? And why would Krishna make Maya have this dominion? And Srila Prabhupada would, re would remind them. 
you are in this predicament because you are not sufficiently afraid of Maya. We are not sufficiently afraid of this material energy. We have not given her her proper respect. So we, we see there's a thunderstorm and there's lightning and we go inside. We try to make sure that we gro ground ourselves because we have the proper respect for the lightning. We understood. It could be very bad for us. But we don't have that same respect for material energy and material nature. Once, Janava Mata, who is the wife of Lord Nityananda, one of the most merciful, compassionate, bewildering entities to ever grace this earth and give us love of God. Janava Mata, his wife, was traveling and she was the head of all the Vaishnavas at one point. And as she was traveling, she was giving many lectures and of course there were many people who were not happy about that. And so there was a band of thieves that thought to kill her and steal whatever wealth and riches there were. And as they were going and thinking about this plan, they were so close to executing it. And just as they were going to execute this plan, the goddess Durga appears before them, very angry, with a trident, very, very upset. She says, you have all been worshipping me for so long, but now you think to kill Janava Mata? Can't you see that she and I are one and the same? You can't understand that she is the origin of me, the same worshipful Devi that you have been worshipping all of this time. How dare you? Go and seek shelter from her and never think to complete this plan ever again. The thieves had to go. They had to go and seek her blessings. And they had to go and admit that they were thinking of the wrong thing and then never, ever continue with that plan ever again. So if you notice, we've snuck in John of Adavi's glories now. So we've been living under the shelter of mercy. We haven't had to have Durga Devi come face to face with us and tell us how foolish we are. We have, in a way, whenever material nature sits us down and reminds us of how great we are not. Can we see it as, oh, Krishna decided to remove a little bit of the covering just so that we understand how he has been sheltering us? The same way that Drishtabuddhi was let off the hook countless times by the king, saved from the harsh reactions of the law. Does he learn yet? Because this is all of our stories, isn't it? Drishtabuddhi is all of us. We've been doing anything and everything. So let's see, does he learn yet? So he was caught and released in this way many times, but at last, sick of his arrogance and total disrespect for others and their property, the ill-mannered Drishtabuddhi was apprehended handcuffed and then beaten. After whipping him, the king's marshals warned him, O oh, evil-minded one, there is no place for you in this kingdom. So kicked out of the family, now kicked out of the kingdom. However, Drishtabuddhi was freed from his tribulation by his father and immediately thereafter entered the dense forest. He wandered here and there, hungry and thirsty and suffering greatly. Eventually, he began killing the jungle animals, the lions, deer, boars, and even wolves for food. Always ready in his hand was his bow. Always on his shoulder was his quiver full of arrows. He also killed many birds, such as chakoras, peacocks, pankas, doves, and pigeons. Now, see, I, you know, I, I'm not one for that, although I do feel like in New York that might be a little bit of a blessing. We have so many pigeons. I have several that were outside my window just a second ago. Like they were just these morning doves and they were pigeons and they were just, they come, they often listen to Krishna Kata. Sometimes they try to build a nest on my AC. And then sometimes I try to tell them, I'm like, okay, go on now, you should go. Because they also carry with them all kinds of like mites and little insects and stuff. And you're like, I don't want those. So, you know, he was, he was killing all of these things, which sometimes we hear is a little bit of crowd control. But Drishtabuddhi was living in the way that most Americans live. 
right? The, the demand was greater than the supply. And for what? Could you really eat all of these things? So he slaughtered many species unhesitatingly of birds and animals to maintain his sinful way of life. The sinful results accumulating more and more each day. On account of his previous sins, he was now immersed in an ocean of great sin that was so relentless that it appeared that he could not get out. And that's the tangled web. Sometimes the reaction to the sinful activity is that we're caught up in more sinful activity. The reaction is that we're now caught up in this tangled web and it seems as though we're in an ocean of sin and suffering and we can't get out. Who will save us? Who will even hear us if we cried out at that point? Who would care? Jishtabuddhi was always miserable and anxious, but one day, during the month of Vaishak, by the force of some of his past merit, he chanced upon the sacred ashram of Kundinya Muni. The great sage had just finished bathing in the Ganges River, and water was dripping from him still. Jishtabuddhi had the good, the good, great fortune to touch some of those droplets of water that were falling from the great sage's wet clothing. Instantly, Drishtabuddhi was freed from his ignorance and his sinful reactions were reduced. Offering his humble obeisances to Kondinya Muni, Drishtabuddhi prayed to him with joined palms, O oh, great Brahmana, please describe to me some of the atonement I may perform without too much endeavor. I have committed so many sins in my life and these have now made me very poor. So he's so humble, so desperate, but not too desperate to put in, you know, with, with not so much endeavor. Like, let's be real. Let's be honest. I want to perform something, eh, but don't make it too hard. Because I don't have that much faith in myself. This is us every Akadashi. Oh, dear Lord, please help us. But don't make it too hard. This is where the buckwheat tortillas and the almond flour tortillas come in. It's, it's, it, we, we're going to do this, but I, I still need something. Almond flour really does win on Akadashi, by the way. My sister has made some almond flour cakes that made me rethink things. It made me think twice. Like, it, is this really Akadashi? This is almost too good. Like, I, I don't know. This is, this is too good. So she, she's done some magic, you know? Krishna has given her some magic in the spoons and in the bowls and the pots, and it works. So this is, we are all living Drishtabuddhi's situation. Lord, give us something, but not too much endeavor. Let's see if the sage laughs at him and tells him to go home. The great Rishi replied, O oh son, listen with great attention, for by hearing me, your life will change and you will become free of all your remaining sins. In the light fortnight of this very month, Vaishak, there occurs the sacred Mohini Akadashi, which has the power to nullify sins as vast and weighty as Mount Sumeru. If you follow my advice and faithfully observe a fast on the Sakadashi, which is so dear to Lord Hari, you will be freed from all the sinful reactions of many, many births. So not only could he be freed from the reactions of that one birth where he had done a lot, friends, he was doing the most, but many births? Hearing these words with great joy, Drishtabuddhi promised to observe a fast on Mohini Akadashi according to the sage's instructions and direction. O best of kings, O Ramachandra Bhagavan, by fasting completely on Mohini Akadashi, the once sinful Drishtabuddhi, the prodigal son of the merchant Donfala, became sinless. Afterwards, he achieved a beautiful transcendental form and free at last of all obstacles, rode upon the carrier of Lord Vishnu Garuda to the supreme abode of the Lord. O Ramachandra, the fast day of Mohini Akadashi removes the darkest illusory attachments to material existence. There is thus no better fast day in all the three worlds than this. Lord Sri Krishna concluded, and so, O Yudhishthir, there is no place of pilgrimage, no sacrifice, and no charity that can bestow merit equal to even one sixteenth of the merit a faithful devotee of mine obtains by observing the Mohini Ekadashi. And he who hears 
and studies the glories of Mohini Agadaji, achieves the merit of giving away 1,000 cows in charity. Thus ends the narration of the glories of Vaishak Shukla Agadaji or Mohini Agadaji from the Kurma Purana. How incredible. How incredible is our Krishna. All glories to Dishtabuti. I almost kind of want to thank him. Thank you for doing all the things that we are afraid of doing and then honestly doing them so that we could talk about them for the rest of the millennium. For the rest of time. Imagine being, being an example of first what not to do and then exactly what to do. So he did everything. And his sinful reactions were that he was miserable. He didn't feel good. So can we, can we be redeemed? Yes. And sometimes the sinful reaction is that we feel miserable. Right? You, you go and you eat the things that you know you're allergic to. It doesn't feel great. We do the things that we know are causing a spiritual allergic reaction. It doesn't feel great. We fall back into those habits that we know are not good for us. But we tell, the mind tells us, just, just chill out. Take it easy. Must you be so spiritual all the time? You need a couple of hours for yourself just, just to turn your mind off. And we know, I've been down this road before. It actually doesn't turn out the way I think it's going to turn out. But without, we try again. And then we get the spiritual allergic reaction and we're itchy. We've got hives and it doesn't feel great. Our stomach is cramping. Nothing feels good. We're miserable. Can we allow ourselves to simply surrender to the process? which doesn't have too much endeavor. And what I like is so many Akadashis, when you hear the glories, they'll tell you about all the things you need to do to complete that Akadashi. Here they did not. They just say one who observes a complete fast becomes sinless. Whatever that complete fast means. And in comes our Srila Prabhupada with a banner, a flag waving of mercy, saying, don't worry. You don't just have to eat once a day. You don't just have to do a complete near jal. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to stay up all night. Just increase your chanting and hearing and fast from grains and beans. Have all the almond flour tortillas you want. No problem. Srila Prabhupada is so merciful, so kind, so willing to meet us wherever we need to be met because we are praying hard. Lord, we need to be saved from the suffering. I'm suffering. But don't make the solution too difficult. I don't have faith in myself yet that I can follow all of the stringent rules. Even down to chanting 64 rounds on this Ikadashi day. No problem. Don't do it. 32? No problem. 25? No problem. Okay, 16. Even if you can't, Simply chant something with full attention and watch how Krishna arranges for us to increase. Just chant something. Srila Prabhupada has done us such a service. I, uh, I heard a story recently from a Christian that made me absolutely cry thinking about Srila Prabhupada's mercy. And I'd like to share that with you all, if you will allow me. So there was once a man who had a dream. And in that dream, he was in kind of like a library room. And there were books and catalog cards and all kinds of things. He took out one card. And on the card, there was an action that he wasn't proud of. Call it whatever you like. An addiction to alcohol, whatever it is was written on the card. And he thought, oh, this doesn't make me feel good. And he realized that the whole room was full of cards with all of his actions. Actions that he was not proud of. Actions that he was not happy with. All filled up this entire room. That is overwhelming to the heart. Thinking of looking at a room of all of our past misdeeds, all of the things that we'd like to forget, now all housed in this one room. Next, 
in walked Jesus, the very last person he would want to see. Because why would you want to see the spiritual teacher in the room with you and all the things that you would not like to look at? Jesus took the card. And on that card was written the man's name. Right? You've got like an addiction. Man's name. He crossed out the man's name, wrote his own name, Jesus, and underneath wrote, paid in full. And then he commenced to do that with every card in the room. This is the compassion of great saints, willing to take all of the sinful things that we are not proud of and say, they're paid in full. Don't worry. Shishiradha Murlidari Kija, Shigoda Chandra Kija. Srila Prabhupada crossed seas, dealt with heart attacks, many strokes, no doctors, prayed to Krishna, wait, but just give me a little more time. For what? To be able to come into each of our lives and make those allowances. All of the things you are afraid of, they're paid in full. You no longer have to suffer for any of those reactions. Every time we surrender to Krishna, it's like a new initiation day. And at the end of that initiation, what happens? We take a final banana. We recite a prayer. We place that banana into the fire. What are we placing in there? Friends, that is the, the room cataloging all of our past misdeeds. We have now invested all of that into that one banana. And as we say a heartfelt prayer to the Lord, Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahman Hitaya Cha Jagadditaya Krishnaya Go Vindaya Namo Namaha. And we place it into the fire we enter into a spiritual contract and our gurus say, it's all paid in full now. Now all you have to do is be Krishna conscious. Each day. And that perfection in our spiritual lives simply means that we keep trying. Many uh, philosophers nowadays have said that real love means forever tries means trying forever. That's what it means to get it right, that we just try again and again. Perfection in our spiritual life means that we just keep trying, that we never give up trying. And Krishna will send all of his greatest, best devotees and friends to remind us Everything that you are afraid of, all the things that you don't think you can come back from, all the things, why would God love you when I am like this and like this and like this? It's all paid in full. Due to Srila Prabhupada's mercy, he was willing to say, I will make the contract. I will speak for you. I will advocate for you. And I often think, when we are standing in front of material nature, who is a judge, she is very, a very harsh critic. Who will speak for my lackluster love? So fickle, here today, gone tomorrow. Today I can feel like, oh, Krishna, you've done everything. And tomorrow I will turn around and tell him he's done nothing. It is not fixed. It is not focused. Rukmini Devi. See, I had, to, I had to weave it in. I, I, I wove in everything else. Even Prahlad, there was a little hint, if you could catch it, right? Jai and Vijay, there was, there was a hint. I have to weave in Rukmini Devi. Even Rukmini Devi. She becomes the celebrated wife of Krishna. But before that, she was 14 to 16. And in a letter, she writes, I can understand if you won't accept me, my lord. In fact, I probably brought it on myself. How can I think that you would want to accept me? Have I done enough? But if you don't want to accept me, that's fine. I will wait lifetime after lifetime until you do. That is not my mood. 
I am constantly sitting here like, Lord, you better accept me this moment or it's done. You better accept me this Akadish year. Tomorrow I'm not trying anymore. You've already put me through way too much. I've had to go through a Kali Yuga, all the things that I've had to go through, right? I, I start listing them. I had to be born premature, and I had to be in this place, and I have to be in this in this realm where people look at me weird because I'm in a woman's body or I have a skin color, and look at all these things that I've had to go through. So, you should accept me now, just the way I am, even though I'm not really willing to put in that much more endeavor. And I'm not really going to be fixed about my faith either, because tomorrow my faith might be missing completely. Right? You never know what you're going to get on any given day. But you should accept me this day. Why? What have I brought to the relationship between me and Krishna? If anyone else did that to me and they were thinking, you know, you, I should, you should just accept me. And we should be together for lifetimes. Like, well, well why? Just because of how amazing you are and your sunny disposition? Because my, my disposition is hardly sunny. Most of the time, you know, we're chanting Japa and we're just getting through it. And then we rejoice. Got my rounds done. Woohoo! Like if I got on the phone with someone and they were constantly like, when can I get off the phone with you? And then we finally, okay, the conversation is done. Like, oh, thank God. Woo! I had to talk to you for like two hours today. And then I have to do it again tomorrow. Like what kind of toxic relationship is this? Everybody needs therapy at this point. And this is how we expect Krishna to accept us. And friends, the most incredible thing is that he does. Every day. And as soon as we even begin to think about calling out his name, he comes running back. That is why Maya is such a harsh critic. Because she knows my Lord will not even stand up for himself. My dear brother won't even stand up for himself in the face of such a toxic love. He'll just keep running back to these people. I've seen them hurt him again and again. And he keeps going back. Let, let me step in and, and try and play referee at least. So who will be my advocate? I can't even advocate for myself. I can't even say, I'm worth it now. I've learned my lesson. I'm on the straight and narrow. I'm worth it now. I can't even say that with confidence. Srila Prabhupada will come and say it with confidence. He believes that I'm worth it now. Why? <laughs> Why? But he does. And so with the faith that Srila Prabhupada has in me, I can fast on this Akadashi. And I can wholeheartedly believe that all of those debts of sinful reactions have been paid in full. I don't have to go back to that room anymore. I don't have to be ashamed anymore. I don't have to feel the guilt anymore. It's been paid in full. Thanks to all of my spiritual teachers. Thanks to all of these saints willing to walk through the fire for me, you, all of us. Thanks to Ekadashi Devi. Thanks to Yudhishthir asking these questions. And thanks to Drishtabuddhi for living such a relatable life. This is our blessing. We can all do it. And at the end of this day, we can Recite this one prayer. Oh Lord, I may not have done everything perfectly. In fact, I may have done everything imperfectly. But I've done it with you in mind. Please accept whatever I have done. Forgive me for whatever has not been done. And please know that at the core of my heart, I simply want to please you. Thank you so much. Ekadashi Devi Ki Beautiful class. Sam, thanks for giving such a relatable class. Everybody was getting terrified when we were describing the mentality of an inattentive chamber. <laughs> so hearing Kabu's eyes were growing big. God. And then, and then he said, still, Krishna accepts you. Prabhupada, you're the advocate. Very, very nice class. Thank you.
both kid in class. We can take one reflection, Rupesh Kumar for group class. Hare Krishna Mataji, beautiful, beautiful class. I guess you move heard a million stories in one uh, one lecture. That's truly beautiful. And uh, and reflecting on it, the way in the sands of time, the continuum of, of time, even great uh, folks like uh, Jay Vijay, who could get the glance of his divine ship, mm -hmm. full glance of divine ship, every milli millisecond or nanosecond, could could become the greatest demons, <laughs> uh, fallen souls. And like our uh, Jagai Madai, who we are trying to attack his lordship himself, <laughs> could become his own devotees and uh, teach preachers, uh, teachers. That's, that's beautiful. So, and also Sri Ramachandra that you shared is always, always here. Sri Ramachandra's story is always a reference. So I'm, I'm just trying to have a contextual understanding of yesterday is something that story and today is something about that. You're saying that Sri Ramachandra retreated into the cave for his longing towards mm -hmm. Sita, can we consider that that attachment you mentioned with the attachments to a Sita? Can we think that it was an unhealthy relationship uh, as to start mm -hmm. with and which became healthier after his finance? Or uh, because here here's a mm -hmm. different thing. I'm trying to understand the rasas, right? Because when we look at Madhurya Kadambini and these books and all these interesting tales, there are different types of rasa, right? There is uh, dasya rasa. There is Vatsalya rasa is maybe may so. So the Vatsalya rasa that is there of the Shraddha for his son, mm. if that is unhealthy relationship or attachment, can we consider this rasa that is there for this romantic rasa or prem rasa that is there between Sri Ramachandra and Sita is also unhealthy? Or how do, how do we actually intellectually debate this thing? I'm, I'm just kind of confused. I'm, I'm a novice devotee just starting off, so just try to understand a bit, uh, Mataji. Actually, I'm glad that you brought that up because that was one point that I wanted to make and didn't think I had time to make it. Uh, so Sri Ram is saying he's suffering in the absence of his wife. It's a little weird, isn't it? You know, um, we, we often think that the Lord should be Atmaram, never attached. I was just reading in first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. And of course, there's famous verses. Famously, the Lord comes into Dwarka and he's greeted by all of his wives. And they say that by their, by their innocence, they thought that they had controlled the Supreme Lord. But the Lord is famous as Atmaram, never, never attached, completely detached. And I cried. I said, enough. I've heard enough about this detached Lord. If he's so detached, why are we doing all this? Like, does he even care about me then? If he's so detached, does he care if I'm there worshipping or not worshipping? Then it becomes like, oh, I'm only worshipping for my own gain. But we're supposed to be getting free from our own gain. Unmotivated, uninterrupted, right? This devotional service is supposed to be unmotivated and uninterrupted. Where do I go for help? And I cried because I was so frustrated about hearing about my detached Lord. It just did not sit well with me because I'm a person who needs to know that the people that I love are attached to me because I'm attached to them. And so I thought, if I'm having this yearning, they've always told me, all my spiritual teachers have told me, you have all of these yearnings because ultimately it is within that relationship with Krishna. So somewhere there must be this yearning. I, I have to have some attachment. There must be something there. Well, well, what's the deal? And then I went and I was reading the same Srimad Bhagavatam, but with the commentaries of Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. And so he, he uses those verses in, in a different way. He says that there were some who glanced on the Lord with prema, with love. And there were some who glanced on the Lord with almost a facade of love. It's a little deceitful. It's a little fake. For those who glanced on him with love, he was completely controlled. And for those who glanced on him with deceit, he wasn't. But they say in Takorji's commentaries that the Lord had an uninterrupted love for his queens. 
Even Parvati Devi was a little bit astonished at looking at how Ram was lamenting in the absence of his wife. She was thinking, Oh Mahadev, you've said that this is your worshipful Lord. How is the Lord so attached that he's lamenting in this way? One, because shouldn't he know what's already going to happen? He knows past, present, and future. Why is he lamenting? What is this? This is the Lord's desire. The Lord desires to be controlled by love. And so they say that the Lord is Atmaram, self-satisfied. But when he comes in contact with those devotees who have prema, premanjana chudita bhakti gilochanena, their eyes have the ointment, the kajal, the eyeliner of love on them. When the Lord gets that, that hint, the whiff, he willingly removes his potency where he is not controlled or conquered. And the unconquerable becomes conquered. The Lord told Prahlad Maharaj once, Prahlad had vowed to defeat a hunter or someone who he thought was a hunter, turns out to be God. And he says, oh my Lord, I vowed to defeat you. What am I supposed to do now? And the Lord appeared to Prahlad and he said, oh Prahlad, I am always conquered by your love. So this is the attachment. This is the only healthy attachment. This is the real love. What we are dealing with here is a very poor, distorted reflection. But when it is directed toward Krishna, and when Krishna feels that reciprocation toward us, it is a transcendental love which never breeds an unhealthy attachment. Even Dasarath didn't have to have an unhealthy attachment. That attachment to Ram was the supreme attachment. Kunti Devi says in her prayers famously, she says that she wants to give up the attachment for family so that I can always be directed toward you, Krishna. But Srila Prabhupada famously says in the purport, will Krishna destroy those attachments? No, because her family were devotees. We are supposed to be attached to devotees. We are supposed to be attached to association with devotees because that is the real treasure of our lives. In the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Shiva himself says that this association is the greatest gift. Seeing the form of the Lord that the devotees hold dear is the greatest gift. And we should seek that out with all of our being. So the attachment that Ram and Sita had for one another is not a material attachment. If it were, then we could say, well, maybe there's some unhealthy things in there. But because this is an attachment built on prema, not calm, it is built on prema, which is undying, which is uninterrupted, which is more extraordinary than we have words for. It is never unhealthy. That is the one place, our spirituality is the one place where we should risk it all for love, where we should fall head over heels, where we should jump in. Because within Prema and within transcendental love, there is also responsibility and accountability. The Lord is not looking to take advantage of us, to exploit us because of our love. The Lord is not looking at us because, at, as though we are weak because we are in love. That is not a weakness there. That prema becomes the greatest strength because of the responsibility, because of the accountability. Sri Ram was ready to do whatever Sita asked him. And there was responsibility. Sita goes through a seeming trial by fire. Spoiler alert. He goes and he has to get back his kidnapped wife. And when he sees her again, she has to walk through fire to prove that she is pure. But that's not actually why. Our saints and our acharyas tell us that this was not actually Sita. This was a shadow version of Sita, whose name was Vedavati. Looked just like Sita. But she took Sita's place so that Sita would not be manhandled by a demon. So that Sita would not spend 10 months, almost a year, in the kingdom of this demon. And so Vedavati, this expansion of Sita, took her place. 
And so Ram had taken a vow. This is where that responsibility and accountability comes in. He says, I will only have one wife. I'll never even glance on another woman. And so when he sees the shadow of this Vedavati coming, he understands, this is not my Sita. When she goes through the fire, Vedavati goes and hangs out with Agnidev in the fire. And then Agnidev brings Sita back. I've kept her safely. Please, my Lord, take your wife. So this attachment is the only healthy attachment, really. It is the attachment that we can base our lives around. And it gets scary because we think, but is that even possible? We, we think it's supposed to be possible between devotees, with Krishna in the center, but is it really possible? My own scars internally tell me it can't be. Everyone will want to exploit me. I've been so disappointed. Krishna can't do this. It is possible. It takes a lot of work. It takes a willingness to endeavor, but it is possible. And when that prema happens, the Lord develops a transcendental greed, Gorgovinda Maharaj says. And this transcendental greed is the same greed that causes Lord Nishingadev to look at Prahlad Maharaj and think, this little boy had so much love and respect for his father. Where's my father? Lord Nishingadev appeared from a pillar. And so he looks at this pillar and he thinks, that's my parent? I can't have any loving relationships with the pillar. But the Lord is hungry, greedy for loving relationships. And so now the Lord develops a greed. And if we notice, after the pastime of Lord Nishringadev, when the Lord appears, he has parents. He says, never again will I do this thing where I don't have parents. Prahlad is even looking at me as a father. And he's looking at me with such love in his eyes. I'm his protector. I'm his father. I'm his everything. I want to experience a love where I can look at someone as they are my everything. And so, these incarnations have parents. Because the Lord is greedy for love. He is attached and conquered and controlled by love. And so my heart was very much consoled. I stopped crying. I figured out a way to be Krishna conscious again. And I had hope. My Lord that I am attached to is not detached from me. He's not detached from any of us. The good news on this Akadashi is that he is so attached to all of us that he will be in transcendental anxiety for us at any given moment. When we are going through hardships, our Lord is in anxiety. The same way the Lord was in anxiety thinking about Sita is the same way he thinks about all of us. So it is not unhealthy. It is the most healthy. <laughs> it is the most transcendental attachment. And I urge all of us, myself included, I use this as a reminder, get more attached. Today is the day. It is a perfect day. Get more attached. Get as attached as you can. And then when you think, I've gotten as attached as I can, get more attached. Because the Lord will reciprocate and he will be even more attached to us. Really, really a great story of Vedavati, the hidden story finally you shared it with us, Matali. Really a beautiful story after a long, long time. Uh, and thanks for sharing that. I don't know if, if Krishna would have born to me or Rama would have born to me, I would have never let go him to any other place. Forget a forest. <laughs> right? How do we let that sun go? <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and, uh, Interestingly enough, since you mentioned that uh, Marks and Press, after the Simma Avatar and all of this, Sira Avatar is the first Avatar that he takes where he enjoys the Marks and Press, even before Krishna Avatar. <laughs> That's right. He wants parents. He wants that love. Hare Krishna Mata. Always with the help. Hare Krishna. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Ashwita Gopi, for addressing our concerns and fears that Krishna doesn't care, Krishna cares, mm -hmm. Krishna loves us, he's there for us, uh, he wants us uh, to turn to him. Thank you, Chita Gopi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks everyone for participating in this class. We invite you to live under the umbrella of mercy. Get out of the tangled web 
of our karmic reactions. For thanks, our mind is chosen for us. It's unbelievable. It's not even us. So, come, come. We have tortillas for you. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Krishna is there. He wants you here. Thank you very much. It should go to beautiful class as always. Happy Akadashi to uh, all the listeners, Scarlett and Mangi. Thank you for turning on your cameras. Darshan of the devotees. Yes, Hi. Andrea. Darshan of the devotees. Henry, Prabhu, Papi C, Amita Kishori, Dini Chasti, William Prabhu and family, Bruce Prabhu, Yogeshwari, Dana Krishna, Svarabhani. Thank you for sticking around, yeah. dear devotee. Suzanne, Susanna, Sharmila Devi, Prima Vinodmi, Didi Rupesh Kumar. Beautiful question. By Prakshit Maharaj. Very nice question. Uh, Leslie, Pink Yogi of Holland, Dan Kelly Prabhu. Thank you. We love you all dearly. Krishna loves you. He cares. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful Akadashi. Very Krishna. So much. Bye bye.